Welcome back to another episode. Today we have the pleasure of having Martin Kelsey in our studio. First thing I want to say is it's actually my pleasure to be here because you get an idea of what GHI is externally and then you come here and you see what it really is and you see all the people working here in the production line and everything and it's it's just absolutely fascinating. Oh, so thank I you. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. And and it's fantastic to meet all the great people and Gary. So <laughs> and Gary. And Gary. So no, it's great. It's great. Can we learn more about like your background? Like where you started? How did you become a developer? How did you get into software and hardware? Yeah. And yeah. and actually I learned something new about you that you're actually a an ele electrical engineer, right? Yes, you're, you're I start, started. You started hardware, but you yeah. are a software expert. So yeah. how did that happen? The common thread through all of my university career was uh, software. And that was the part I enjoyed the most. That was the homework that got done first and I realized actually what I want to do is software. In doing software your hands are the last hands to touch the product. The bits that you write, the pieces that you put to code, that's what ships. That's, so that's a very <laughs> interesting perspective. I never yeah. thought of software, as, but you're right. Yeah. Software is the last thing to go on the product. Yeah. After a long university career, uh, I finally finished in, in software engineering. So you did get some software through college. I started as a paper tape and a uh, punch card uh, developer. <laughs> so I really started back way back. What about the cassettes? Well, I, I, cassettes were a step up for me. So <laughs> that was an upgrade. I then got a job in college at Radio Shack. And I was in Radio Shack in 1977 uh, on the day when the first box with a TRS-80 came in. And they said, why don't you set that up? And that kind of was what got me started on microcomputers, was, was working with that unboxing it. And then I became the expert on that, that TRS-80. Um, and I, I think I paid around, for my first TRS-80, I paid around $4,000 uh, for, for something that's just, uh, you know, not even the capability of the like, smallest board like you two sell. Me two megahertz, maybe? or One megahertz. What, no, what it, it full, full flat out scream and one megahertz. And, and I did get the full 32,000 words of memory. And, uh, <laughs> the cassette tape player and I had a disk drive one of the first disk drives too and then as far as far as like embedded system or microcontrollers as we know it today when when did you when or how did you get started in the embed, in the embedded world so a lot of people move up into bigger bigger computers and what happened to me was computers got bigger around me and it wasn't that I decided to go into embedded computing, it's just these classic processors, the Z80 and so forth, became the embedded processors as other things grew up bigger and bigger. And I just kind of stayed close to the metal and enjoyed programming there on things, on things where I was actually working with the hardware. If I could write code that would make things clink and clank and roll and, and do these things, then that was, that was it for me. And, and was it in assembly or there was actually a, like a, a... But assembly today is not what assembly used to be. So PDP assembler and BAL, uh, the old IBM BAL assembler and Burroughs assembler and some of these old mainframe assemblers, you could get the whole instruction sheet on the front and back of a little cart. Okay. Now if you try and do assembler on modern processors, no, you need a whole book just to list the, the instruction code. So no, I'm quite happy to build on top of uh, on top of other people's work on on that. I'll go fix a firmware bug if I have to, but it's not it's not where I live. I don't necessarily want to be down there engineering um, the garbage collector or things like that. No, I, I like to be a little higher than that and actually interact with the hardware, but not have to do the very very low level things. I like to write things that make wheels turn, that make real hardware uh, uh, move. But I don't want to spend a week trying to blink an LED. I mean, there's something I can build on. So I. So you I want still to love the hardware. Like you. Yeah. You 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 mostly program, but there is somewhere deep inside you want hardware. You want to see something blinking, something moving, something mechanical. I have to. Or physical. Yeah, I have to. I I've always been close to um, close to the real hardware. Uh, and I've managed to twist my Microsoft career, so I still to this day work for Microsoft, and I, I have managed to twist my Microsoft career uh, always close to the hardware. Oh. I worked with the original uh, Microsoft uh, robotics team and, and helped find uh, found the original Microsoft robotics team. Uh, I was one of the original members for uh, uh, Windows Media Center. 
uh, which was really a very hardware, in those days, hardware-focused project because the group that developed Windows Media Center was really two groups. One that did the uh, driver design for all of these new video inputs. Uh, and in those days, there, was even, there wasn't an e enough computer power even to move video through the machine yes. fast enough. Yes. The group I ran the development effort for was um, the group that did the, the visual experience, so a DirectX-based visual experience. It's so always somewhere in my career I've managed to squeeze hardware in there somehow. And at, and at that point, were you programming in a, like a more like modern language as we know it today, like a C-sharp or like yeah. some .NET language? Or? If uh, you're familiar with GPU programming and DirectX programming, you know that you do a mixture of uh, vertex shader programs that run on the GPU, plus you have to do some C, C++ and COM type programming, and then we also then scripted a lot of things in C-sharp. At what point you started actually getting into, let's say, micro framework or, or any technology before that, where you get sure. into .NET or modern language on, on a, an, a deep embedded device, as in like a single yeah. chip. So I've, I had the good fortune to be very close to the development, um, close physically to the development both of Spot, which became NetMF, and Gadgeteer. Spot is the original watch by Microsoft that run some version of early .NET micro framework, which then transitioned into .NET micro framework or NetMF for short, which now runs on different microcontrollers. When you're doing uh, programs in uh, NetMF, uh, you're including things that say Microsoft.spot, and people don't yes. necessarily well, where always that remember where from? they come like from. The yeah. first time I saw it, like, what is Spot? Why, yep. why is it there? And, and it's still there today. It's still there today. It's still there. It lives as a name. Yes. Uh, it lived as a name a lot longer than the product ever lived. So smart personal object technology is Spot. So they were working in the same building uh, on Microsoft campus as I was working in. So I got exposed to that early on. You have one of the watches? Uh, more than one, actually. Oh. Uh, so I have everybody. Like version 0 0.1 and version 0 0.2. <laughs> I don't have any, I don't have any pre-release stuff, but uh, uh, we did have a lot of them around the office. But I, I went out and bought the real one. Do you remember the Timex watch from Microsoft that uh, had a camera in it and you would, you would hold it up to the screen to program uh, from, your, from your CRT? To continue the original story, I was also a few doors down from the folks at Microsoft Research Cambridge in Cambridge in the UK. I worked in Cambridge in the UK from 2008 to 2010 and that's when they did the original Dragonfly slash uh, uh, Gadgeteer. Uh, Gadgeteer. Uh, and so I saw many, many iterations of the prototypes of that there, and it was very interesting. And so, I was so you have seen the birth of .NET Micro Framework. I saw the birth of it there, which yeah. was Spot, and then yeah. it became Micro Framework. And you've seen the birth of Dragonfly, which then became, as yes. people know it as a, as Gadgeteer. As Gadgeteer, and uh, it was really an interesting evolution. I mean, they really were working very hard to make this a very intuitive. Uh, can't go wrong kind of hardware platform. I think they succeeded very well in that. At that point, that's when I got into a .NET Micro Framework in my search for more fun things to do, came across GHI technology. You know, the integration with Visual Studio, uh, you can't beat it. Uh, it's about as easy as it is. And as I said earlier, I don't want to be the guy fumbling with tool chains and what do I have to do to get to the point where I can blink a light. I want to blink the light. I want to do something meaningful and the GHI technology and the tool chain and so forth was so easy and so plug and play. I could just concentrate on doing things. Um, what was your very first GHI product? Uh, I did a few things with the Panda 2, and of course, almost everything I've done, I've always wanted it to be network connected. So always in there was some sort of radio device or Wi-Fi or whatever, and little devices by themselves are not near as interesting as orchestrations of devices that uh, yes. are sort of more than the sum of the parts, you yeah. know. It's, it's just a pleasure having you here, and, and I would love to mention that you have been great to, to our community. Uh -huh. You have contributed many drivers, a lot of codes, the BrainPad bridge that you created, which mm -hmm. is, that allows Scratch uh, to work with the BrainPad, so you can use uh, Scratch as basically blocks, like Blockly, if you're familiar with Blockly, and you would use blocks to control, let's say, uh, a, a, any device. And BrainPad became one of the options uh, 
thanks to, to your efforts. That was just one thing. And then also you built this awesome driver that wraps uh, like the uh, ESP32 and the other ESP, like mm -hmm. uh, 8266, I believe. Yep. Uh, the ST Wi Fi, the uh, Wiznet, mm -hmm. Ethernet chip, all these are wrapped into a nice .NET friendly socket interface so you can actually work with, enjoy working with the hardware from a high level. You don't need to understand the commands and the AT commands and what's coming. Uh, under under mm -hmm. the hood, so that's another open source library that is yep. that is provided. It's out there on uh, GitHub. Is it on GitHub? It's on GitHub. Yeah, it's on GitHub. It's also available through NuGet, um, and I'm looking forward to evolving that for TinyCLR. So you can do the same things with TinyCLR, uh, and I will continue doing those things. And it's been great to have the support uh, uh, of GHI, particularly on the BrainPad, and and uh, uh, support on the other drivers. So yeah, I'm going to keep going. Great, great, thank yeah. you. So if somebody wants to get a hold of you, is mm -hmm. there like a um, preferred way? Uh, are you, do you have a blog somewhere or? or oh, I've probably got too many things up. And so, <laughs> so I think if, if people want to get a hold of me, uh, use my email address and, and uh, perhaps you can put that on, uh, on screen then. Uh, my email address is mcalsyn, M-C-A-L-S-Y-N, at pervasive.digital. And that's what I use for all of my embedded Okay. Work. So, okay. Thank you. Right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, we loved having you here, mm -hmm. and I would love to learn more about everything you have done. Fantastic. So maybe we'll do another tech talk in the future. I'd look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>